escorted by a squadron of fighter planes, we flew southward at an altitude of somewhat over 3,000 feet a few miles from the battle zone. Visibility was perfect. From above, the battle for the capital of the Rye looked innocuous. After an unmolested century and a half Berlin was once more being conquered by enemy troops, but it all seemed to be taking place in an uncannily peaceful landscape whose roads, villages, and small towns I knew so well from innumerable drives. All that could be seen were brief, inconspicuous flashes from artillery or exploding shells, looking no more impressive than the flare of a match, and burning farm buildings. But on the eastern boundary of Berlin, far off in mist, larger billows of smoke could be discerned. The roar of the motor drowned out the distant noises of battle. The escort squadron flew on to attack ground targets south of Potsdam, while we landed in Gatow. The airfield was almost deserted. Only General Christian, who as Jodl's assistant belonged to Hitler's staff, was getting ready to leave by plane. We exchanged a few trivial phrases. Then I and my escort entered the two stalks, enjoying the sense of adventure, for we could also have driven by car and skimmed over the same route which I had driven with Hitler on the eve of his 50th birthday. To the surprise of the few drivers on the broad avenue, we landed just in front of the Brandenburg Gate. We stopped an army vehicle and had it drive us to the Chancellery. By this time it was late afternoon, it had taken some ten hours to cover the hundred miles between Wilsnack and Berlin. It was not at all clear to me if I was running a risk in meeting with Hitler, Moody as he was, I had no idea how he might feel toward me after these two days. But in a sense I no longer cared. Of course I hoped the encounter would turn out all right, but I had also to take a bad outcome into consideration. The chancellery which I had built seven years before was already under fire from heavy Soviet artillery, but as yet direct hits were relatively rare. The effect of these shells seemed insignificant compared to the rubble that a few American daylight air raids had made of my building during the past few weeks. I climbed over a hurdle of burned beams, walked under collapsing ceilings, and came to the sitting room in which, a few years ago, our evenings had dragged on, where Bismarck had held social gatherings and where Hitler's adjutant Schaub was now drinking brandy, in the company of a few people, few of whom I knew. In spite of my telephone call they had ceased expecting me and were astonished to see me turn up. Schaub's cordial welcome was reassuring and seemed to indicate that no one at headquarters knew anything about my Hamburg recording. Then Schaub left us to announce my arrival. Meanwhile, I asked Lieutenant Colonel von Poser to enlist the aid of the Chancellery telephone switchboard to locate Luschen and ask him to come to the Chancellery. Hitler's adjutant returned, the Führer is ready to see you. How often in the past twelve years had I been ushered into Hitler's presence with these words? But I was not thinking of that as I descended the fifty-odd steps into the bunker, but if I would be ascending them with a whole skin. The first person I met below was Bormann. He came forward to meet me with such unwanted politeness that I began feeling more secure. For Bormann's or Schaub's expressions had always been reliable guides to Hitler's mood. Humbly, he said to me, when you speak with the Führer, Hell certainly raised the question of whether we ought to stay in Berlin or fly to Berchtesgaden. But it's high time he took over the command in South Germany. These are the last hours when it will be possible. You'll persuade him to fly out, won't you? If there were anyone in the bunker attached to his life. It was obviously Bormann, who only three weeks earlier had enjoined the functionaries of the party to overcome all weaknesses, to win the victory or die at their posts. Three, I gave a non-committal reply, feeling a belated sense of triumph at his almost imploring manner. Then I was led into Hitler's room in the bunker. In his welcome there was no sign of the warmth with which he had responded a few weeks before to my vow of loyalty. He showed no emotion at all. Once again I had the feeling that he was empty, burned out, lifeless. He assumed that business-like expression which could be a mask for anything and asked me what I thought about Denitz's approach to his job. 
I had the distinct feeling that he was not asking about Dennett's by chance, but that the question involved his successor. And to this day I think that Dennett's liquidated the hopeless legacy that unexpectedly became his lot with more prudence, dignity, and responsibility than Borman or Himmler would have done. I voiced my favorable impression of the Admiral, now and then enriching my account with anecdotes which I knew would please Hitler. But with the wisdom of long experience I did not try to influence him in Dennett's favor, for fear that this would drive him in the opposite direction. Abruptly, Hitler asked me, What do you think? Should I stay here or fly to Birchtsgaden? Jodl has told me that tomorrow is the last chance for that. Spontaneously, I advised him to stay in Berlin. What would he do at Obas Salzburg? With Berlin gone, the war would be over in any case, I said. It seems to me better, if it must be, that you end your life here in the capital as the Führer rather than in your weekend house. Once more I was deeply moved. At the time I thought that was a piece of good advice. Actually it was bad, for if he had flown to Obers Salzburg the battle for Berlin would probably have been shortened by a week. That day he said nothing more of an imminent turning point or that there was still hope. Rather apathetically, wearily and as if it were already a matter of course, he began speaking of his death, I too have resolved to stay here. I only wanted to hear your view once more. Without excitement, he continued, I shall not fight personally. There is always the danger that I would only be wounded and fall into the hands of the Russians alive. I don't want my enemies to disgrace my body either. I've given orders that I be cremated. Fräulein Braun wants to depart this life with me, and I'll shoot Blondie beforehand. Believe me. Spear it is easy for me to end my life. A brief moment and I am freed of everything, liberated from this painful existence. I felt as if I had been talking with a man already departed. The atmosphere grew increasingly uncanny, the tragedy was approaching its end. During the last months I had hated him at times, fought him, lied to him, and deceived him. But at this moment I was confused and emotionally shaken. In this state, I confessed to him in a low voice, to my own surprise, that I had not carried out any demolitions but had actually prevented them. For a moment his eyes filled with tears. But he did not react. Such questions, so important to him only a few weeks before, were now remote. Absently, he stared at me as I faltered out my offer to stay in Berlin. He did not answer. Perhaps he sensed that I did not mean it. I have often asked myself since whether he had not always known instinctively that I had been working against him during these past months and whether he had not deduced this from my memoranda, also whether by letting me act contrary to his orders he had not provided a fresh example of the multiple strata in his mysterious personality. I shall never know. Just then General Krebs, the army chief of staff, was announced. He had come to give the situation report. Krebs was acting for the Ilgarderian. Hitler had officially assigned the supreme command of the armed forces to Key Eitel and limited himself to commanding the troops in Berlin. But I had the impression that he did not want to recognize this as a fact. Even as commander of Berlin, Hitler did not leave his bunker, he issued all his orders from his desk. Apparently this meeting on April 23rd was what was called a minor situation conference, since neither the Commandant of Berlin nor the other troop commanders attended. In that respect nothing had changed. The Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces was receiving the situation reports from the fronts as always. Only three days before the situation room in the bunker could hardly hold the crowd of high-ranking officers, commanders of various departments of the Wehrmacht and SS but now almost all had left in the meantime. Along with Goering, Dennis and Himmler, Ki Eitel and Jodl, Air Force Chief of Staff Koller, and the most important officers of their staffs were now outside of Berlin. Only lower-ranking liaison officers had remained. And the nature of the report had changed. Nothing but vague scraps of news were coming from outside. The Chief of Staff could offer little more than conjectures. 
the map he spread out in front of Hitler covered only the area around Berlin and Potsdam. But even here the data on the status of the Soviet advance no longer corresponded with the observations I had made a few hours before. The Soviet troops had long since come closer than the map indicated. To my astonishment, during the conference Hitler once again tried to make a display of optimism, although he had only just finished talking with me about his impending death and the disposition of his body. On the other hand, he had lost much of his former persuasiveness. Krebs listened to him patiently and politely. Often in the past, when the situation was clearly desperate but Hitler continued undeterred to conjure up a favorable outcome, I had thought he was the captive of obsessional ideas. Now it became evident that he spoke two languages at once. How long had he been deceiving us? Since when had he realized that the struggle was lost? since the winter at the gates of Moscow, since Stalingrad, since the Allied invasion, since the Ardennes offensive of December 1944? How much was pretense, how much calculation? But perhaps it was merely that I had just witnessed another of his rapid changes of mood and that he was being as sincere with General Krebs as he had earlier been with me. The situation conference, which ordinarily went on for hours, was quickly ended. Its very brevity revealed that this remnant of a headquarters was in its death throes. On this day Hitler even restrained from swooping us off into the dream world of providential miracles. We were dismissed with a few words and left the room in which so dreary a chapter of errors, omissions, and crimes had been played out. Hitler had treated me as an ordinary guest, as if I had not flown to Berlin especially for his sake. We parted without shaking hands, in the most casual manner, as if we would be seeing each other the next day. Outside the room I met Goebbels. He announced, yesterday the Fr. took a decision of enormous importance. He has stopped the fighting in the West so that the Anglo-American troops can enter Berlin unhindered. Here again was one of those mirages which excited the minds of these men for a few hours and aroused new hopes which as quickly as they had come would be replaced by others. Goebbels told me that his wife and six children were now living in the bunker as Hitler's guests, in order, as he put it, to end their lives at this historic site. In contrast to Hitler, he appeared to be in fullest control of his thoughts and emotions. He showed no sign of having settled his accounts with life. By this time it was late afternoon. An SS doctor informed me that Frau Goebbels was in bed, very weak and suffering from heart attacks. I sent word to her asking her to receive me. I would have liked to talk to her alone, but Goebbels was already waiting in an anteroom and led me into the little chamber deep underground where she lay in a plain bed. She was pale and spoke only trivialities in a low voice, although I could sense that she was in deep agony over the irrevocably approaching hour when her children must die. Since Goebbels remained persistently at my side, our conversation was limited to the state of her health. Only as I was on the point of leaving did she hint at what she was really feeling, how happy I am that at least Harold, her son by her first marriage, is alive. I too felt confined and could scarcely find words, but what could anyone say in this situation? We said goodbye in awkward silence. Her husband had not allowed us even a few minutes alone for our farewell. Meanwhile, there was a flurry of excitement in the vestibule. A telegram had arrived from Goering, which Bormann hastily brought to Hitler. I trailed informally along after him, chiefly out of curiosity. In the telegram Goering merely asked Hitler whether, in keeping with the decree on the succession, he should assume the leadership of the entire Reich if Hitler remained in Fortress Berlin. But Bormann claimed that Goering had launched a coup d'etat, perhaps this was Bormann's last effort to induce Hitler to fly to Berchtesgaden and take control there. At first, Hitler responded to this news with the same apathy he had shown all day long. But Bormann's theory was given fresh support when another radio message from Goering arrived. I pocketed a copy which in the general confusion lay unnoticed in the bunker. It read, to Reich Minister von Ribbentrop. I have asked the Fr. to provide me with instructions by 10 p.m. April 23rd. 
If by this time it is apparent that the Fuhrer has been deprived of his freedom of action to conduct the affairs of the Reich, his decree of June 29, 1941, becomes effective, according to which I am heir to all his offices as his deputy. If, by 12 midnight April 23, 1945, you receive no other word either from the Fuhrer directly or from me, you are to come to me at once by air. Signed, Goering, Rye Marshal. Here was fresh material for Bormann. Goering is engaged in treason. He exclaimed excitedly. He's already sending telegrams to members of the government and announcing that on the basis of his powers he will assume your office at 12 o'clock tonight, mein Fuhrer. Although Hitler had remained calm when the first telegram arrived, Bormann now won his game. Hitler immediately stripped Goering of his rights of succession, Bormann himself drafted the radio message, and accused him of treason to Hitler and betrayal of National Socialism. The message to Goering went on to say that Hitler would exempt him from further punishment if the Reich Marshal would promptly resign all his offices for reasons of health. Bormann had at last managed to rouse Hitler from his lethargy. An outburst of wild fury followed in which feelings of bitterness, helplessness, self-pity, and despair mingled. With flushed face and staring eyes, Hitler ranted as if he had forgotten the presence of his entourage, I've known it all along. I know that Goering is lazy. He let the Air Force go to pot. He was corrupt. His example made corruption possible in our state. Besides he's been a drug addict for years. I've known it all along. So Hitler had known all that but had done nothing about it. And then, with startling abruptness, he lapsed back into his apathy, well, all right. Let Goering negotiate the surrender. If the war is lost anyhow, it doesn't matter who does it. That sentence expressed contempt for the German people, Goering was still good enough for the purposes of capitulation. After this crisis, Hitler had reached the end of his strength. He dropped back into the weary tone that had been characteristic of him earlier that day. For years he had overtaxed himself, for years, mustering that immoderate will of his, he had thrust away from himself and others the growing certainty of this end. Now he no longer had the energy to conceal his condition. He was giving up. About half an hour later Bormann brought in Goering's telegram of reply. Because of a severe heart attack Goering was resigning all his powers. How often before Hitler had removed an inconvenient associate not by dismissal, but by an allegation of illness, merely to preserve the German people's faith in the internal unity of the top leadership. Even now, when all was almost over, Hitler remained true to this habit of observing public decorum. Only now, at the very last hour, had Bormann reached his goal. Goering was eliminated. Possibly Bormann also was aware of Goering's failings, but he had hated and now overthrown the Reich Marshal solely because he had held too much power. In a way I felt sympathy for Goering at this time. I recalled the conversation in which he had assured me of his loyalty to Hitler. The brief thunderstorm staged by Bormann was over, a few bars of Gotterdam rung had sounded and faded. The supposed Hagen had left the stage. To my surprise, Hitler was amenable to a request of mine, though I made it with considerable trepidation. Several Czech managers of the Skoda works were expecting an unpleasant fate from the Russians because of their collaboration with us. They were probably right about that. On the other hand, because of their former relations with American industry they were placing their hopes of safety on flying to American headquarters. A few days before Hitler would have strictly outlawed any such proposal. But now he was prepared to sign an order waiving all formalities so that the men could fly to safety. While I was discussing this point with Hitler, Bormann reminded him that Ribbentrop was still waiting for an audience. Hitler reacted nervously, I've already said several times that I don't want to see him. For some reason the idea of meeting Ribbentrop annoyed him. Bormann insisted, Ribbentrop has said he won't move from the threshold, that he'll wait the like a faithful dog until you call him. This figure of speech softened Hitler, he had Ribbentrop summoned. They talked alone. Apparently Hitler told him about the escape plan of the Czech managers. 
but even in this desperate situation the foreign minister fought to defend his jurisdictional rights. In the corridor he grumbled to me, that is a matter for the foreign office. In a somewhat milder tone he added, in this particular case I have no objection if the document will say, at the suggestion of the foreign minister. I added these words, Ribbentrop was content, and Hitler signed the paper. This was, so far as I know, Hitler's last official dealing with his foreign minister. In the meantime my paternal adviser of the past few months, Friedrich Luschen, had arrived at the Chancellery. But all my efforts to persuade him to leave Berlin remained vain. We told each other goodbye. Later, in Nuremberg, I learned that he had committed suicide after the fall of Berlin. Toward midnight Eva Braun sent an SS orderly to invite me to the small room in the bunker that was both her bedroom and living room. It was pleasantly furnished, she had had some of the expensive furniture which I had designed for her years ago brought from her two rooms in the upper floors of the Chancellery. Neither the proportions nor the pieces selected fitted into the gloomy surroundings. To complete the irony, one of the inlays on the doors of the chest was a four-leaf clover incorporating her initials. We were able to talk honestly, for Hitler had withdrawn. She was the only prominent candidate for death in this bunker who displayed an admirable and superior composure. While all the others were abnormal, exaltedly heroic like Goebbels, bent on saving his skin like Bormann, exhausted like Hitler or in total collapse like Frau Goebbels, Eva Braun radiated in almost gay serenity. How about a bottle of champagne for our farewell? And some sweets? I'm sure you haven't eaten in a long time. I was touched by her concern, she was the first person to think that I might be hungry after my many hours in the bunker. The orderly brought a bottle of Moet et Chandon, cake, and sweets. We remained alone. You know. It was good that you came back once more. The Freer had assumed you would be working against him. But your visit has proved the opposite to him, hasn't it? I did not answer that question. Anyhow, he liked what you said to him today. He has made up his mind to stay here, and I am staying with him. And you know the rest, too, of course. He wanted to send me back to Munich. But I refused, I've come to end it here. She was also the only person in the bunker capable of humane considerations. Why do so many more people have to be killed? She asked. And it's all for nothing. Incidentally, you almost came too late. Yesterday the situation was so terrible it seemed the Russians would quickly occupy all of Berlin. The Fro was on the point of giving up. But Goebbels talked to him and persuaded him, and so we're still here. She went on talking easily and informally with me, occasionally bursting out against Bormann, who was pursuing his intrigues up to the last. But again and again she came back to the declaration that she was happy here in the bunker. By now it was about three o'clock in the morning. Hitler was awake again. I sent word that I wanted to bid him goodbye. The day had worn me out, and I was afraid that I would not be able to control myself at our parting. Trembling, the prematurely aged man stood before me for the last time, the man to whom I had dedicated my life twelve years before. I was both moved and confused. For his part, he showed no emotion when we confronted one another. His words were as cold as his hand, so, you're leaving? Good. Off we listen. No regards to my family, no wishes, no thanks, no farewell. For a moment I lost my composure, said something about coming back. But he could easily see that it was a white lie, and turned his attention to something else. I was dismissed. Ten minutes later, with hardly another word spoken to anyone, I left the Chancellor's residence. I wanted to walk once more through the neighboring Chancellery, which I had built. Since the lights were no longer functioning, I contented myself with a few farewell minutes in the court of honor, whose outlines could scarcely be seen against the night sky. I sensed rather than saw the architecture. There was an almost ghostly quiet about everything, like a night in the mountains. The noise of a great city, which in earlier years had penetrated to here even during the night, had totally ceased. 
At rather long intervals I heard the detonations of Russian shells. Such was my last visit to the Chancellery. Years ago I had built it, full of plans, prospects, and dreams for the future. Now I was leaving the ruins of my building, and of the most significant years of my life. How was it? Poser asked. Thank God, I don't have to play the part of a Prince Max of Baden. Prince Max of Baden was appointed Imperial Chancellor at the end of the First World War. In that capacity he declared the Kaiser's abdication, negotiated the armistice, and turned the government of Germany over to the socialists, for all of which acts he was much criticized. Translator's note. I answered with relief. I had correctly interpreted Hitler's coolness at our parting, for six days later, in his political testament, he excluded me and appointed Saw, his favorite for some time, as my successor. The road between the Brandenburg Gate and the Victory Column had been converted into a runway by the use of red lanterns. Labor squads had filled the holes from the latest shell hits. We started without incident. I saw a shadow rush by the right side of the plane, the Victory Column. Then we were in the air, and undisturbed. In and around Berlin we saw many large fires, the flashes of artillery, flares that looked like fireflies. Still, the scene could not be compared with that produced by a single heavy air raid on Berlin. We headed toward a gap in the ring of artillery fire, where the darkness was still tranquil. Toward five o'clock, with the first glimmers of dawn, we arrived back at the Richland airfield. I had a fighter plane ready to deliver the Führer's order concerning the Skoda managers to Karl Hermann Frank, Hitler's deputy in Prague. I never did find out if the messenger arrived. Since I wanted to avoid being chased along the roads by low level English fighters, I postponed driving to Hamburg until evening. Himmler, I heard at the airfield, was staying only 25 miles away at the hospital that had sheltered me a year before under such curious circumstances. We decided to visit him, landing in our stork on a nearby field. Himmler was quite surprised to see me. He received me in the very room where I had lain during my illness, and to make the situation even more grotesque, Dr. Jebhardt was also present. As always, Himmler displayed that special brand of cordiality toward a fellow official which effectively cut off all intimacy. He was interested chiefly in my experiences in Berlin. Undoubtedly he had heard of Hitler's treatment of Kering by now, but he passed over it. And even when I somewhat hesitantly told the story of Goering's resignation, he maintained that it meant nothing. Goering is going to be the successor now. We've long had an understanding that I would be his premier. Even without Hitler, I can make him chief of state. You know what he's like, he added with a conniving smile and without the slightest embarrassment. Naturally I'll be the one to make the decisions. I've already been in touch with various persons I mean to take into my cabinet. Key Eitel is coming to see me shortly. Perhaps Himmler assumed that I had come to see him to wheedle a post in his new government. The world in which Himmler was still moving was fantastic. Europe cannot manage without me in the future either, he commented. It will go on needing me as Minister of Police. After I've spent an hour with Eisenhower he'll appreciate that fact. They'll soon realize that they're dependent on me, or they'll have a hopeless chaos on their hands. He spoke of his contacts with Count Bernadotte, which involved transfer of the concentration camps to the International Red Cross. Now I understood why I had seen so many parked Red Cross trucks in the Saxon wild near Hamburg. Earlier, they had always talked about liquidating all political prisoners before the end. Now Himmler was trying to strike some private bargains with the victors. Hitler himself, as my last talk with him had made apparent, had put such ideas far behind him. Finally, Himmler after all held out a faint prospect of my becoming a minister in his government. For my part, with some sarcasm I offered him my plane so that he could pay a farewell visit to Hitler. But Himmler waved that aside. He had no time for that now, he said. Unemotionally, he explained, now I must prepare my new government. And besides, 
my person is too important for the future of Germany for me to risk the flight. The arrival of Key Eitel put an end to our conversation. On my way out I heard the field marshal, in the same firm voice with which he so frequently addressed high-flown sentimental declarations to Hitler, now assuring Himmler of his unconditional loyalty and announcing that he was entirely at his disposal. That evening I returned to Hamburg. The Gauliter offered to have my speech to the people broadcast by the Hamburg station at once, that is, even before Hitler's death. But as I thought of the drama that must be taking place during these days, these very hours, in the Berlin bunker, I realized that I had lost all urge to continue my opposition. Once more Hitler had succeeded in paralyzing me psychically. To myself, and perhaps to others, I justified my change of mind on the grounds that it would be wrong and pointless to try to intervene now in the course of the tragedy. I said goodbye to Kaufmann and set out for Schleswig Holstein. We moved into our trailer on Newton Lake. Occasionally I visited Denitz or members of the general staff, who like me were at a standstill, awaiting further developments. Thus, I happened to be present on May 1, 1945, when Denitz was handed the radio message. The first radio message, dated April 30, 1945, 6.35 p.m. read. Grand Admiral Dennitz. In place of the former I Marshal Goering the Freer has designated you as his successor. Written authorization on the way. Immediately take all measures required by the present situation. Bormann. The radio message sent on May 1, 1945, at 3.18 p.m. read. Grand Admiral Dennitz, top secret. Only via officer. For deceased yesterday at 3.30 p.m. Testament of April 29th appoints you Reich President, Minister Goebbels Chancellor, Reichslitter Bormann Party Minister, Minister Sasing Quart Foreign Minister. On the Fra's instructions the testament sent out of Berlin to you and to Field Marshal Skarmer, to assure its preservation for the people. Reichslitter Bormann will try to get to you today to orient you on the situation. The form and time of announcement to the troops and public are left to you. Confirm receipt. Goebbels Bormann. Significantly curtailing his rights as Hitler's successor. Hitler had appointed the cabinet for the new president of the Reich, Goebbels was chancellor, Seysinkwart, foreign minister, and Bormann, party minister. Along with this message came one from Bormann announcing that he would be coming to see Denitz shortly. This is utterly impossible. Dennitz exclaimed, for this made a farce of the powers of his office. Has anyone else seen the radio message yet? Except for the radioman and the admiral's adjutant, Ludnurat, who had taken the message directly to his chief, no one had. Dennitz then ordered that the radioman be sworn to silence and the message locked up and kept confidential. What will we do if Bormann and Goebbels actually arrive here? Dennitz asked. Then he continued resolutely, I absolutely will not cooperate with them in any case. That evening we both agreed that Bormann and Goebbels must somehow be placed under arrest. Thus Hitler forced Dennitz, as his first official function, to commit an act of illegality, concealing an official document. Strictly speaking, Dennitz could not claim that his succession to Hitler was constitutionally legal since the constitution of the German Reich would have required an election. Rather, his legitimacy as Hitler's successor was based on his predecessor's charisma, a fact which Dennitz confirmed in his public acts by constantly invoking Hitler's last will and testament. Thus, this first official act of Dennitz's was illegal only insofar as he was disregarding an important aspect of Hitler's testament after first assenting to it by accepting the functions of the office. Hitler's idea of imposing his choices of cabinet ministers on his successor was, by the way, one of the most absurd inspirations of his career as a statesman. Again, he failed to make clear, as in other cases during the past years, who was to have the ultimate decision-making power, the chancellor rather than his cabinet or the president. According to the letter of the testament, Dennis could not dismiss the chancellor or any of the ministers even if they proved unfit for office. This was the last link in a chain of deceptions, 
betrayals, hypocrisies, and intrigues during those days and weeks. Himmler had betrayed his Frau by negotiations, Bormann had carried off his last great intrigue against Goering by playing on Hitler's feelings, Goering was hoping to strike a bargain with the Allies, Kaufmann had made a deal with the British and was willing to provide me with radio facilities, Key Eitel was hiring out to a new master while Hitler was still alive, and I myself, finally, had in the past months deceived the man who had discovered me and furthered my career, I had even at times considered how to kill him. All of us felt forced to these acts by the system which we ourselves represented, and forced also by Hitler, who for his part had betrayed us all, himself and his people. On this note the Third Reich ended. On the evening of that May 1st, when Hitler's death was announced, I slept in a small room in Dönitz's quarters. When I unpacked my bag I found the red leather case containing Hitler's portrait. My secretary had included it in my luggage. My nerves had reached their limit. When I stood the photograph up, a fit of weeping overcame me. That was the end of my relationship to Hitler. Only now was the spell broken, the magic extinguished. What remained were images of graveyards, of shattered cities, of millions of mourners, of concentration camps. Not all these images came into my mind at this moment, but they were there, somehow present in me. I fell into a deep, exhausted sleep. Two weeks later, staggered by the revelations of the crimes in the concentration camps, I wrote to the chairman of the ministerial cabinet, Schwerin Krosik. The previous leadership of the German nation bears a collective guilt for the fate that now hangs over the German people. Each member of that leadership must personally assume his responsibility in such a way that the guilt which might otherwise descend upon the German people is expiated. With that, there began a segment of my life which has not ended to this day. Epilogue 33. Stations of Imprisonment Karl Dennitz the new chief of state, was still caught up in the ideas of the National Socialist regime, just as I was, and more than either of us imagined. For twelve years we had served that regime, we thought it would be cheap opportunism now to make a sharp turnabout. But the death of Hitler broke that mental bind which had for so long warped our thinking. For Dennitz this meant that the objectivity of the trained military officer came to the fore. From the moment he took over, Dennett's held that we should end the war as quickly as possible, and that once this task was done, our work was over. On that very May 1, 1945, one of the first military conferences took place between Dennett's as the new commander-in-chief of the armed forces and Field Marshal Ernst Busch. Busch wanted to attack the superior British forces advancing on Hamburg, while Dennett's was against any offensive measures. All that should be done, he said was to keep the way to the west open as long as possible for the refugees from the east. Columns of them were blocked near Lübeck, a delaying action by the German troops in the west should be continued only to allow the flow to continue, Dennis said. Bush made a great to-do about the Grand Admirals no longer acting in Hitler's spirit. But Dennis was no longer moved by such exhortations. The day before, in a dispute with the new chief of state, Himmler had been made to understand that there was no place for him in the new government. Nevertheless, the next day he turned up unannounced at Dennitz's headquarters. It was around noon, and Dennitz invited Himmler and me to dine with him, though not out of any special friendliness. However much he disliked Himmler, Dennitz would have regarded it as discourteous to treat a man who had so recently held so much power with contempt. Himmler brought the news that Gorlitz Kaufmann intended to surrender Hamburg without a fight. A leaflet addressed to the populace was now being printed, Himmler said, to prepare the way for the impending entrance of British troops into the city. Dennis was angry. If everyone acted on his own, he said, his assignment no longer had any point. I offered to drive to Hamburg to talk with Kaufmann. Kaufmann, well protected in his headquarters by his bodyguard of students, was no less agitated than Dennett's. The commandant of the city had received orders to fight for Hamburg, he told me. 
but the British had issued an ultimatum that if Hamburg were not surrendered, they would order the heaviest bombing the city had ever received. Am I supposed to follow the example of the Gauliter of Bremen? Kaufmann continued. He issued a proclamation calling on the people to defend themselves to the last, and then cleared out while the city was demolished by a frightful air raid. He was so determined to prevent a battle for Hamburg, Kaufmann told me, that if necessary he would mobilize the masses to active resistance against the defenders of the city. I telephoned Dennitz and told him of the threat of open rebellion in Hamburg. Dennitz asked time to consider. About an hour later he issued the order to the commandant to surrender the city without a fight. On April 21, at the time I was recording my speech at the Hamburg radio station, Kaufmann had proposed that the two of us let ourselves be taken prisoner together. Now he renewed this offer. But I rejected this idea, as I also did the plan for a temporary flight which our champion dive bomber pilot, Werner Bornbach, had earlier suggested to me. Bornbach had the use of a long-range four-motored seaplane which throughout the war had plied between northern Norway and a German weather station in Greenland to supply the station with provisions. Bornbach proposed that we use it to take me and a few friends to one of the many quiet bays of Greenland for the first few months after the occupation of Germany. Boxes of books were already packed, as well as medicines, writing materials, and a great deal of paper, for I wanted to start on my memoirs without delay. We would also take along rifles, my fault boat, skis, tents, hand grenades for fishing, and food. In those days Greenland seemed so distant and isolated that even intensive air reconnaissance scarcely seemed a real threat. The supple planes for these weather stations could carry enough fuel to fly to England, where we planned to turn ourselves in late in the fall of 1945. Ever since seeing the huge film So's Iceberg I had dreamed of a lengthy vacation in Greenland. But since Dennitz was now head of the government, I cancelled this plan with its combination of panic and rank romanticism. Burning oil trucks and automobiles shot up only minutes before lay by the side of the road, with English fighter planes flying overhead, as I drove back to Uten Lake. In Schleswig the traffic was heavier, a jumble of military vehicles, civilian cars, columns of people on foot, some soldiers, some civilians. When I was occasionally recognized, no one said anything angry. There was an air of friendly, regretful constraint about the way people greeted me. I arrived at the headquarters in Plon on the evening of May 2nd. Dennis had already moved to Flensburg to evade the rapidly advancing British troops. But I met Key Eitel and Jodl, who were on the point of leaving to join their new master. Dennis had taken up quarters on the passenger ship Patria. We had breakfast together in the captain's cabin and there I presented him with an edict prohibiting the destruction of any facilities, including bridges. He promptly signed it. Thus I had achieved at last every point of the program I had demanded of Hitler on March 19, although it was now far too late. Dennis at once saw the merit of my making a speech urging the German people in the areas already captured by the enemy to hurl all their energies into reconstruction. The speech was intended to counteract the lethargy which has come over the people as a result of the paralyzing horror and the immeasurable disillusionment of recent months. All Dennis asked was that I show the speech to Schwerin Krosig, the new foreign minister, at the present headquarters of the government, the naval school at Merwick near Flensburg. Schwerin Krosig also agreed to the broadcast if I would add a few sentences to explain the present policy of the government. He dictated these to me. It was an abridged version of the speech I had recorded at the Hamburg radio station on April 21, 1945. The edition requested by Schwerin Krosig Creed, only for this reason, to avoid casualties in the civilian population. Does the Grand Admiral feel compelled to continue the fighting? The sole purpose of the struggle which is still being waged is to prevent the Germans fleeing from the Soviet armies or threatened by them, from perishing. This last obligation in Germany's heroic struggle is what our people, who have borne all the sufferings of this war so gallantly, must now assume.
the only stations in our possession which could still broadcast, Copenhagen and Oslo, were hooked in when I read the speech in the Flensburg studio. When I stepped out of the broadcasting studio, I found him awaiting for me. We still held valuable territories such as Norway and Denmark, he reminded me self-importantly, territories which we could regard as pledges for our security. These were of sufficient importance to the enemy so that we could negotiate concessions for ourselves in exchange for the assurance that we would surrender them intact. My speech suggested that we would hand over these areas without a fight and without asking anything in return, it was consequently a harmful speech, Himmler argued. He then surprised Key Eitel by proposing that a censor be installed to pass on all public announcements of the government, he himself would be glad to assume this task. But that same day Denitz had already rejected similar suggestions from Turboven, Hitler's governor in Norway. On May 6, Dennis signed an order prohibiting demolitions of any kind in the still occupied territories, parts of Holland and Czechoslovakia, Denmark and Norway. This was the final rejection of any policy of pledges, as Himmler called it. In the same spirit the Grand Admiral said no to any plan to transfer himself and the new government to Denmark or Prague, despite the fact that Flensburg might be occupied by the British any day. Himmler in particular felt drawn to Prague. An old imperial city, he urged, was more fitting as the headquarters of a government than historically insignificant Flensburg. He omitted to add that by moving to Prague we would be passing from the sphere where the navy held power into the sphere of the SS. Dennitz finally cut off the discussion by stating flatly that we would certainly not continue our activities beyond the German borders. If the British want to capture us here, let them do it. Himmler then began pressing Bormbach, who had been placed in charge of the government air squadron, to provide him with a plane so that he could escape to Prague. Bormbach and I decided that we would land him on an airfield already held by the enemy. But Himmler's intelligence service was still functioning. When people fly in your planes, he snarled at Bormbach, they don't know where they're going to land. A few days later, as soon as communications with Field Marshal Montgomery had been established, Timler gave Jodl a letter asking him to have it passed on to Montgomery. As General Kinsel, the liaison officer to the British forces, told me, Himmler asked for an interview with the British Field Marshal under a safe conduct. Should he be taken prisoner he wanted it established that by the laws of war he had a right to be treated as a high-ranking general since he had been commander-in-chief of the Vistula Army Group. But this letter never arrived. Jodl destroyed it, as he told me in Nuremberg. As happens in critical situations, those days revealed the characters of men. Gorlitikoch of East Prussia, at one time Reich Commissioner for the Ukraine, arrived in Flensburg to demand a submarine so that he could escape to South America. Gorlitikoch's made the same demand. Dennett's flatly refused. Rosenberg, now the oldest righteous litter of the National Socialist Party, wanted to dissolve the party. He alone had the right to issue such an order, he declared. A few days later he was found almost lifeless in Merwick. He spoke of having poisoned himself, and a suicide attempt was suspected, but it turned out that he was merely drunk. On the other hand some manifested courageous attitudes. A good many of the leaders refrained from disappearing into the masses of refugees swarming into Holstein. Seysinkwart, the Reich Commissioner for the Occupied Netherlands, rode a PT boat through the enemy blockade at night to confer with Dennitz and me, but he refused the chance to remain at the seat of government and returned to Holland in his PT boat. My place is there, he said mournfully. I'll be arrested immediately after my return. On May 4 came the armistice in northwest Germany, followed three days later, on May 7, 1945, by the unconditional surrender in all the theatres of war. A day later that capitulation was again solemnly sealed by the signatures of Key Eitel and three representatives of the branches of the Wehrmacht at the Soviet headquarters in Karlshorst, near Berlin. After the signing the Soviet generals whom Goebbels's propaganda had always represented as barbarians without manners or knowledge of civilized conduct, 
served the German delegation a good meal, complete with champagne and caviar, as Ki Eitel told us. On May 6, 1945, the Berliner Zetung printed a report from Chuikov's headquarters, after the signing Ki Eitel and his companions were treated to caviar, vodka, and champagne in the villa placed at their disposal. The meal differed in no respect from the Allies' banquet. Key Eitel obviously had no feeling that after such a step, which meant the end of the Reich and imprisonment for millions of soldiers, it would have been in better taste to refuse the champagne on the victor's table and have taken only what was necessary to still the pangs of hunger. His gratification at this gesture on the part of the victors testified to a sad lack of dignity and sense of decorum. But after all, it had already been much the same at Stalingrad. The British troops encircled Flensburg. There was now only a tiny enclave in which our government still had executive authority. The Control Commission for the OKW, under Major General Rooks, installed itself on the Patria and soon began functioning as a liaison office to the Denitz government. To my mind, the capitulation meant that the Donitz government had done its job in bringing the lost war to an end. On May 7, 1945, I proposed that we issue a last proclamation to the effect that since we no longer had any freedom of action, all we could do was to wind up such matters that had arisen out of the surrender. We expect that the enemy will nevertheless call us to account for our former activities exactly like all the other responsible members of the National Socialist regime. In making this remark I wanted to forestall any misinterpretation of our gesture. One. However, State Secretary Stuckart, now heading the Ministry of the Interior, took a different view. He wrote a memorandum stating that Denitz as chief of state and legitimate successor to Hitler had no right to surrender his position, he must hold it so that the continuity of the German Reich would be preserved and the legitimacy of future governments would not be imperiled. Denitz, though at first more disposed to follow my line, agreed with Stuckart. Thus, the continuance of his government was assured for a whole fifteen days more. The first British and American newspaper men arrived, and each of their stories aroused unrealistic hopes of the most varied kind. Simultaneously, SS uniforms vanished. Overnight Wajena, Stuckart and Ollendorf had become civilians. Jebhardt, Himmler's intimate, actually transformed himself into a Red Cross general. Moreover a government structure began to arise, a consequence of its members having nothing to do. Denitz, in the old fashion of Imperial Germany, appointed a chief of the military cabinet, Admiral Wagner, and a chief of the civilian cabinet, Gorlita Wegener. After some debate it was resolved that the chief of state would continue to be addressed by the title of Grand Admiral. An information service was set up, an old radio set provided the latest news. Even one of Hitler's big Mercedes limousines had found its way to Flensburg and served to convey Denitz to his home all of 500 yards from the offices of the government. A photographer from Heinrich Hoffmann's studio appeared to take pictures of the new government at work. I remarked to Denitz's adjutant that the tragedy was turning into a tragicomedy. Correctly as Denitz had acted up to the capitulation and sensibly as he had worked to bring the war to a quick end, he was now complicating everything and our situation in a totally confusing manner. Two members of the new government, Ministers Back and Dorp Muller, had vanished without a trace. Rumour said they had been taken to Eisenhower's headquarters to begin drafting measures for the reconstruction of Germany. Field Marshal Key Eitel, still chief of the high command of the armed forces, was taken prisoner. Our government was not only impotent, the victors did not deign to notice it. We composed memoranda in a vacuum, trying to offset our unimportance by sham activity. Every morning at ten a cabinet meeting took place in the so-called cabinet room, a former schoolroom. It looked as if Schwerin Krosik was trying to make up for all the cabinet meetings that had not been held during the past twelve years. We used a painted table and chairs collected from around the school. At one of these sessions the acting minister of food brought a few bottles of rye from his stores. We fetched glasses and cups from our rooms and discussed how to reshuffle the cabinet to bring it in line with the changing times. 
A hot debate arose over the question of adding a minister for churches to the cabinet. A well-known theologian was proposed for the post, while others regarded Pastor Nimola as the best candidate. After all, the cabinet ought to be made socially acceptable. My tart suggestion that a few leading social democrats and liberals be brought forth to take over our functions went unnoticed. The food minister's stocks helped to liven the mood of the meeting. We were, I thought, well on the way to making ourselves ridiculous, or rather, we already were ridiculous. The seriousness that had prevailed in this building during the surrender had vanished. On May 15th, I wrote were in Krosik that the government of the Rye must consist of people who could enjoy the confidence of the Allies, the composition of the cabinet must be changed and the closer associates of Hitler replaced. Moreover, I said, it was as foolish to entrust an artist with paying off debts as, in the past, to put a champagne salesman in charge of the foreign ministry. I asked to be relieved of the affairs of the Minister of Economics and Production. I received no reply. After the capitulation subordinate officers of the American and British forces turned up here and there and moved around unabashed in rooms where our seat of government was located. One day in the middle of May an American lieutenant appeared in my room. Do you know where Spear is? He asked. When I identified myself, he explained that American headquarters was accumulating data on the effects of the Allied bombings. Would I be willing to provide information? I said I would. A few days earlier the Duke of Holstein had offered me the castle of Glucksburg, several miles from Flensburg, as quarters for me and my family. That same day I sat in the 16th century castle, built out into the water, with several civilians of my age belonging to the USPS, the United States Strategic Bombing Survey, who were attached to Eisenhower's staff. We discussed the mistakes and peculiarities of the bombings on both sides. The next morning my adjutant reported that many American officers, including a high-ranking general, had arrived at the entrance to the castle. Our guard of soldiers from a German armored force presented arms. Even after the ceasefire, the German troops around Denitz's government seat were allowed to bear light arms. At this meeting I stated, according to the minutes for May 19, 1945, that I have no need of collecting credits in order to avert misinterpretations of my actions. The political aspects will be examined by other quarters. And so, under the protection of German arms, as it were, General F. L. Anderson, commander of the bombers of the American 8th Air Force, entered my apartment. He thanked me in the most courteous fashion for taking part in these discussions. For three days more we went systematically through the various aspects of the war in the air. On May 19 Chairman Franklin Dollier of the USPS, along with his Vice Chairman, Henry C. Alexander, and his assistants, Dr. Galbraith, Paul Nitz, George Ball, Colonel Gilchrist, and Williams, visited. From my own work I could appreciate the great importance of this division for the American military operations. During the next several days an almost comradely tone prevailed in our University of Bombing. It came to a sudden end when Goering's champagne breakfast with General Patton produced banner headlines all over the world. But before that happened General Anderson paid me the most curious and flattering compliment of my career, had I known what this man was achieving. I would have sent out the entire American 8th Air Force merely to put him underground. That Air Force had at its disposal more than 2,000 heavy daylight bombers. It was lucky General Anderson found out too late. The place where my family was staying was 25 miles from Glucksburg. Since the worst that could happen was that I would be arrested a few days earlier, I drove out of the enclave around Flensburg and thanks to the careless unconcern of the British reached the occupied zone without trouble. The British soldiers who were strolling in the streets paid no attention to my car. Heavy tanks stood in the villages, their cannon protected by canvas hoods. So I arrived safely at the door of the country house where my family was staying. We were all delighted at this prank, which I was able to repeat several times. But perhaps I strained British nonchalance too much after all. On May 21st, 
I was taken back to Flensburg in my car and locked in a room at Secret Service headquarters, watched over by a soldier with an automatic rifle on his knees. After a few hours I was released. My car had vanished, the British took me back to Glucksburg in one of their cars. Early in the morning two days later my adjutant came rushing into my bedroom. The British had surrounded Glucksburg. A sergeant entered my room and announced that I was a prisoner. He unbuckled his belt with its pistol, laid it casually on my table, and left the room to give me an opportunity to pack my things. Soon afterward a truck brought me back to Flensburg. As we rode off I could see that many anti-tank guns were trained on Glucksburg Castle. They still thought I might be capable of far more than I was. Shortly afterward the Reich war flag, which had been raised every day at the naval school, was taken down by the British. If anything proved that the Dennitz government, try though it might, was not a new beginning, it was the persistence of this flag. As a matter of fact, at the beginning of our days in Flensburg, Dennis and I had agreed that the flag must remain. We could not pretend to represent anything new, I thought. Flensburg was only the last stage of the Third Reich, nothing more. Under normal circumstances a fall from the heights of power might be attended by grave inner crises. But to my astonishment the fall took place without any perceptible turmoil. I also adapted quickly to the conditions of imprisonment. I ascribe that to my twelve years of training in subordination. For in my own mind I had already been a prisoner under Hitler's regime. Relieved at last of the responsibility for daily decisions, I was overpowered during the early months by a craving for sleep such as I had never felt before. A slackening of the mind took place, although I tried not to let it show. In Flensburg all of us, the members of the Dennitz government, met again in a room that resembled a waiting room. There we sat on benches along the walls, each of us surrounded by suitcases with his personal possessions. We must have looked much like emigrants waiting for their ship. A melancholy mood prevailed. One by one we were summoned to an adjoining room to be registered as prisoners. Depending on their dispositions, the new prisoners returned angry, insulted, or depressed. When my turn came, I too was affronted by the embarrassing physical examination to which I was subjected. Probably it was a consequence of Himmler's suicide, he had kept a poison pill concealed in his gum. Dennis, Jodl, and I were led into a small courtyard in which a dramatically large number of machine guns were directed toward us from the windows of the upper floor. Newspaper photographers and movie cameramen had their turn while I tried to give the impression that this spectacle, which was intended only for the newsreels, did not concern me at all. Then we were squeezed into several trucks along with the others from the waiting room. Ahead of us and behind us, as I could see at curves in the road, we had an escort of thirty to forty armored vehicles, a rare honor for me, accustomed as I was to driving around in my car alone and without protection. At an airport we were loaded into two two-motored cargo planes. Sitting on suitcases and crates, we already very much looked our part of captives. We were not informed of our destination. It took some getting used to, the fact that we would never know where we were being moved to, after so many years in which we had taken it for granted that we were the ones who determined our destinations. On only two of these journeys was the end completely clear the one to Nuremberg and the one to Spandau. We flew over coastal landscapes and then for a long time over the North Sea. Were we bound for London? The plane veered to the south. To judge by the look of the land and the cities we were over France. A large city appeared. Reims, some insisted. But it was Luxembourg. The plane landed, outside a cordon of American soldiers was drawn up in two rows. Each of them had his automatic rifle trained on the narrow lane which we would walk between them. I had seen such a reception only in gangster films when the criminals are finally led off to justice. In open trucks, seated on crude wooden benches and guarded by soldiers again with their guns at the ready, we were taken through several villages where the people in the streets whistled and shouted at us, epithets we could not make out. The first stage of my imprisonment had begun. We stopped at a large building, 
the Palace Hotel in Mondorf, and were led into the lobby. From outside we had been able to see Gring and other former members of the leadership of the Third Reich pacing back and forth. The whole hierarchy was there, ministers, field marshals, Reichslitters, state secretaries, and generals. It was a ghostly experience to find all those who at the end had scattered like chaff in the wind reassembled here. I kept to one side, eager to absorb as much as possible of the quiet of the place. Just once I spoke to Kesselring, asking him why he had continued to blow up bridges instead of sparing them after the command communications to Hitler had been broken. With his inflexible military mentality he replied that bridges had to be destroyed as long as fighting was going on, as commander-in-chief nothing concerned him but the safety of his soldiers. Soon quarrels over rank began. Goering was Hitler's proclaimed successor of earlier years. Dennis the chief of state whom Hitler had appointed at the last moment, but as Reich Marshal, Goering was also the highest ranking military officer. There was a muffled battle between the new chief of state and the deposed successor over the question of who should take precedence in the palace hotel of Mondorf, which had been emptied of all persons but ourselves and our guards, and who in general was top dog of us all. No agreement could be reached. Soon the two principals avoided meeting at the door, while each took the presiding seat at two different tables in the dining room. Goering especially never forgot his station. When Dr. Brandt once casually referred to all he had lost, Goering interrupted snappishly, Oh, come! Don't you talk! You haven't any reason to complain. After all, what did you have? But I! When I'd had so much! Barely two weeks after we were taken to Mondorf I was told that I was going to be transferred. From then on the Americans treated me with just a shade of respect. Many of my fellow prisoners interpreted this transfer over optimistically as a call to assist in the reconstruction of Germany, for they were not yet used to the idea that things really could be managed without us. I was delegated to bring regards to friends and relatives. A car waited outside the entrance to the Palace Hotel, not a truck this time but a limousine, and my guard was not an MP with a submachine gun but a lieutenant who saluted courteously. We drove westward past Reims toward Paris. In the center of the city the lieutenant got out at an administration building and soon returned equipped with a map and fresh orders. We headed upstream along the Seine. In my confusion I thought that we were making for the Bastille, quite forgetting that it had long ago been tommed down. But the lieutenant became uneasy, he compared street names until I realized with relief that he had lost his way. Clumsily, in my school English, I offered to pilot us, but it was only with some hesitation that he told me our destination was the Trianon Palace Hotel in Versailles. I knew the way the well. It was where I had stayed in 1937 when I was designing the German pavilion for the Paris World's Fair. Luxury cars and honor guards at the doors indicated that this hotel was no prison camp but had been taken over by the Allied staffs. It was actually Eisenhower's headquarters. The lieutenant vanished inside while I sat quietly watching the spectacle of high ranking generals driving up. After a long wait, a sergeant conducted us down an avenue. We drove past several meadows straight toward a small palace whose gates opened for us. For several weeks I stayed at Chesney. I ended up in a small room on the third floor of the rear wing. Its appointments were Spartan, an army cot and a chair. The window was laced over with barbed wire. An armed guard was posted at the door. The next day I had the opportunity to admire our little palace from the front. Surrounded by ancient trees, it was situated in a small park beyond whose high wall the adjacent gardens of the Palace of Versailles could be glimpsed. Fine 18th century sculptures created an idyllic atmosphere. I was allowed a half hour walk every day, an armed soldier followed me. We were forbidden to make contact with the other prisoners, but after a few days I learned a bit about them. They were almost exclusively leading technicians and scientists agricultural and railroad specialists, among them former minister Dorp Muller. I recognized Professor Heinkel, the aircraft designer, as well as one of his assistants. 
I also caught glimpses of many other people with whom I had worked. A week after my arrival my permanent guard was withdrawn, and I was allowed to walk about freely. With that, the monotonous period of solitude came to an end and my psychological state improved. New prisoners arrived, various members of my ministry, among them Frank and Saw. We were also joined by technical officers of the American and British forces, who wanted to expand their knowledge of German conditions. My assistants and I agreed that we ought to place our experience in the technology of armaments at their disposal. I could not contribute very much, so I had by far the better knowledge of details. I was extremely grateful to the Commandant, a British parachute major, when he rescued me from this dreary interim by inviting me to take a drive with him. We drove past small palace gardens and parks to Saint Germain, the beautiful creation of Francis I, and from there along the Seine toward Paris. We passed the Cockhardy the famous restaurant in Bagueville where I had spent pleasant evenings with Courtot, Vlaminck, Dispiau, and other French artists, and reached the champs Elysees. Here the Major proposed a stroll, but I said no in his interest, there was always the chance I might be recognized. Crossing the Place de la Concorde we turned into the Quayes along the Seine. The fewer people were about, we ventured a walk and then returned by way of St. Cloud to our palatial prison camp. A few days later a large bus drew up in the prison yard. A whole busload of tourists was quartered with us, among them Schacht and General Thomas, the former chief of the armaments office. Also among the bus passengers were prominent prisoners from German concentration camps who had been liberated by the Americans in South Tyrol, taken to Capri and then transferred to our camp. Word went around that Pastor Nimolo was among them. We did not know him personally, but among the new arrivals was a frail old man, white-haired and wearing a black suit. The designer Fletner, Heinkel, and I agreed he must be Nimolo. We felt great sympathy for this man so visibly marked by many years of concentration camp. Fletner took it upon himself to go over to the broken man and express our sympathy. But he had no sooner addressed him than he was corrected, Thisson. My name is Thisson. Nimola is standing over there. And there he stood, looking youthful and self-possessed, smoking a pipe, an extraordinary example of how the pressures of long imprisonment can be withstood. Later, I often thought about him. The bus drove into the palace courtyard again a few days later and whisked its former passengers off again. Only the Sun and Schacht were left behind with us. When Eisenhower's headquarters was shifted to Frankfurt, a column of some ten American military trucks appeared at our quarters. We prisoners were assigned our places in two open trucks with wooden benches. The other trucks took the furnishings. As we passed through Paris, at every traffic stop a crowd assembled shouting insults and threats. East of Paris we paused in a meadow for a midday rest. Guards and prisoners mingled, a peaceful scene. Our first day's destination was supposed to be Heidelberg. I was glad when we did not make it that night, for it would have pained me to be in prison in my hometown. The next day we reached Mannheim. The city seemed lifeless, the streets were deserted, the buildings shattered. A German private in torn uniform, his face roughly bearded, a cardboard carton on his back stood dully by the side of the road, the image of defeat. At Norheim we turned off the autobahn. Soon afterward we began climbing a steep road and ended up in Kranzberg Castle. In the winter of 1939, I had fitted out and rebuilt this large castle, three miles from Hitler's command center, as a headquarters for Goering. A two-story wing had been added for Goering's large staff of servants, and we prisoners were now quartered in this annex. Here, in contrast to Versailles, there was no barbed wire. Even the windows on the top floor of our servants' wing provided a clear view of the landscape. The wrought iron gate which I had designed was not locked. We were allowed to move about freely in the whole area of the castle. Five years before I had laid out an orchard above the castle, surrounded by a wall some three feet high. Here we could sprawl at ease, 
with a grand view of the Taunus woods and far below as the village of Kranzberg with its gently smoking chimneys. Compared with our fellow countrymen, who were going hungry in their freedom, we were inappropriately well off, for we received the same rations as American troops. But in the village, the prison camp had a bad reputation. Apparently the surrounding populace believed we were being beaten and starved, rumor had it that Leni Riefenstahl was pining away in the dungeon of the tower. Actually we had been brought to this castle to answer questions on the technical conduct of the war. It was the gathering point for all kinds of specialists, almost the entire leadership of my ministry, most of my department heads, most of the leading men in munitions, tank, automobile, ship, aircraft, and textile production, the important figures in chemistry, and such designers as Professor Porsche. But interrogators seldom found their way to us. The prisoners grumbled for most of them rightly hoped that once they had been pumped dry of information they would be released again. Wernher von Braun and his assistants joined us for a few days. He had received offers from the United States and England for himself and his staff, and we discussed these. The Russians, too, had contrived to use the kitchen staff at the heavily guarded Garmis camp to smuggle an offer of a contract to him. For the rest, we banished boredom by early morning sports, a series of scientific lectures, and once Schacht recited poetry, giving astonishingly emotional renderings. A weekly cabaret was also conjured up. We watched the performances, the scenes repeatedly dealt with our own situation, and sometimes tears of laughter ran down our faces at the tumble we had taken. One morning, shortly after six o'clock, one of my former assistants roused me from sleep, I've just heard on the radio that you and Schacht are going to be tried at Nuremberg. I tried to keep my composure, but the news hit me hard. Much as I believed in principle that as one of the leaders of the regime I must take responsibility for its crimes, it was hard for me at first to adjust to the reality. I had felt some trepidation at seeing photographs of the interior of Nuremberg prison in the newspaper. Weeks ago I had read that some of the chief members of the government had been put there. But while my fellow defendant Schacht soon had to exchange our pleasant prison camp for the jail at Nuremberg, weeks were to pass before I was taken there. Although this meant that I was facing charges of the gravest sort, one would never have known it from the behavior of the guards toward me. The Americans said cheerily, you'll soon be acquitted and the whole thing forgotten. Sergeant Williams increased my rations so that, as he said, I would have my strength for the trial, and the British Commandant invited me for a drive the day we met. We drove alone, without guards, through the Taunus woods, lay down for a while under a huge fruit tree, tramped about the woods, and he told me about hunting bears in Kashmir. It was beautiful September weather. Toward the end of the month an American jeep swung in through the gate, the squad that had come to get me. At first the British commandant refused to turn over his prisoner before he had received orders from Frankfurt. Sergeant Williams provided me with innumerable biscuits and asked repeatedly whether I needed anything from his stores. By the time I finally entered the jeep, almost the entire camp community had assembled in the castle yard. Everyone wished me well. I shall never forget the kindly and troubled expression in the eyes of the British colonel as he bade me goodbye. 34. Nuremberg. That evening I was delivered to the notorious interrogation camp of Oberursel near Frankfurt, greeted with crude mocking jokes by the sergeant in charge, and fed a thin, watery soup with which I nibbled my British biscuits. I thought nostalgically of beautiful Kranzburg. That night I heard the rough shouts of the American guards, anxious replies and screams. In the morning a German general was led past me under guard, his face weary and desperate. Finally, we were moved on in a canvas-covered truck. I sat squeezed in tightly with others, among them I recognized the mayor of Stuttgart, Dr. Strolin, and Admiral Horthy, the regent of Hungary. We were not told our destination. But it was obvious, Nuremberg. We arrived there after dark. A gate was opened, 
I stood for some minutes in the corridor of a block of cells which I had seen in the newspaper a few weeks earlier. Before I knew it, I was locked into one of them. Opposite me, Goring peeped out the opening one in his cell door and shook his head. A straw pallet, tattered and filthy old blankets, impassive indifferent guards. Although all four floors of the building were occupied, an eerie silence prevailed, interrupted only by the occasional clang of a cell door when a prisoner was led off for interrogation. Goring, across the corridor from me, walked endlessly back and forth in his cell, at regular intervals I saw part of his massive body passing the peephole. Soon, I too began pacing my cell, at first back and forth and then, the better to utilize the space, around and around. After about a week during which I was ignored and remained in uncertainty, there came a change, a modest one for an ordinary person, for me an enormous one, I was transferred to the sunny side of the prison on the fourth floor, where there were better rooms with better beds. Here the American warden, Colonel Andres, paid a first visit to me, very pleased to see you. As camp commandant in Mondorf he had insisted on the utmost strictness, and I thought I could detect some mockery in his words. On the other hand, it was a pleasure to see the German staff again. The cooks, mess attendants, and barbers had been carefully picked from among prisoners of war. But because they too had known the meaning of imprisonment, they behaved helpfully toward us whenever there were no supervisory personnel about. They managed to whisper to us a good many bits of news from the papers, as well as good wishes and encouragements. If I opened the top pane of the high cell window the patch of sunlight that entered was just big enough for me to sunbathe the upper part of my body. Lying on blankets on the floor, I changed my position as the sun moved until its last slanting ray was gone. There was no light, there were no books or even newspapers. I was wholly cast on myself and had to fend off my growing depression without external aids. Sorkel was frequently led past my cell. Whenever he saw me, he made a face, gloomy but at the same time rather embarrassed. Finally my door too was unlocked. An American soldier awaited me, a note in hand on which were written my name and the room of the interrogating officer. We passed through courtyards and down staircases into the halls of the Nuremberg Palace of Justice. On the way I passed Funk obviously coming from an interrogation, he looked extremely worn and downcast. At our last meeting we had both been free men in Berlin. This is how we meet again. He called out in passing. From the impression he made upon me, tealess and in an unpressed suit, with sallow, unhealthy complexion, I could only deduce that I must be making a similar wretched impression. For I had not seen myself in a mirror for weeks, and that was how it was going to be for years. I also saw Ki Itel standing in a room facing several American officers. He too looked shockingly run down. A young American officer awaited me. He pleasantly invited me to sit down and then began asking for explanations of various matters. Apparently Sorkel had tried to make a better case for himself by branding me as solely responsible for the importation of foreign workers. The officer proved to be well disposed and of his own accord composed an affidavit which straightened out this matter. This somewhat eased my mind, for I had the feeling that since my departure from Mondorf a good deal had been said about me on the principle of incriminate the absent. Shortly afterward I was presented to the deputy prosecutor, Thomas Dodd. His questions were sharp and aggressive. We clashed frequently. I did not want to be cowed and answered candidly and without evasions, giving no thought to my future defense. I deliberately omitted many details which might have sounded like extenuations. Back in my cell, I had the feeling, now you're in the trap. And in fact these statements later constituted an essential part of the charge against me. At the same time, however, the interrogation gave me a certain feeling of buoyancy. I believed and still believe that I acted rightly in offering no excuses and not sparing my own person. Anxiously, but with the resolution to continue along the same path, I waited for the next interrogation, which had already been announced. I was not called again. 
perhaps the prosecution had been impressed by my candor, I do not know the reason. All that followed were several politely formal question sessions with Soviet officers, who were accompanied by a heavily rouged stenographer. Seeing these men badly shook the stereotyped image I still held at that time. After every reply the officers would nod and say, tack, tack which sounded odd but merely meant, as I soon found out, so, so. Once the Soviet colonel asked me, but surely you have read Hitler's Mein Kampf? Actually, I had only leafed through it, partly because Hitler had told me the book was outmoded, partly because it was hard reading. When I said no, he roared with laughter. Somewhat insulted, I withdrew the reply and declared that I had read the book. After all, that was the only believable answer. But in the course of the trial this lie returned to haunt me. In cross-questioning the Soviet prosecution brought up this time I had contradicted myself. Then, under oath, I had to tell the truth and admit that at the interrogation I had spoken a falsehood. At the end of October all the defendants were assembled in the lower story. The whole wing of cells had been cleared of other prisoners. The silence was uncanny. Twenty-one persons were awaiting their trial. The twenty-second defendant, Borman, was to be tried in absentia, Robert Lee had committed suicide before the trial began. Editor's note. Rudolf Hess, flown in from England, had also appeared, wearing a blue-gray coat walking handcuffed between two American soldiers. Hess wore an absent-minded but at the same time obstinate expression. For years I had been accustomed to seeing all these defendants in magnificent uniforms, either unapproachable or jovially expansive. The whole scene now seemed unreal, sometimes I imagined I was dreaming. Nevertheless, we were already behaving like prisoners. Who, for example, in his days as a Rye Marshal or Field Marshal, as a Grand Admiral, Minister, or Reichslitter, would have thought that he would ever submit to intelligence testing by an American military psychologist. And yet this test was not only not resisted, everyone in fact strove to do the best he could on it and see his abilities confirmed. The surprise victor in this test, which embraced memory span, reaction speeds, and imagination, was shacked. He came out on top because the test allowed additional points with increasing age. Say Sinquart, though no one would have foreseen it, achieved the highest actual point score. Goering, too, was among the top scorers, I received a good median rating. A few days after we had been separated from the other prisoners, a commission consisting of several officers entered the deathly stillness of our cell block. They went from cell to cell. I heard them speaking a few words that I could not understand, until finally my door opened and a printed copy of the indictment was unceremoniously handed to me. The preliminary investigation had been concluded. The actual trial was beginning. In my naivete I had imagined that each of us would receive an individual indictment. Now it turned out that we were one and all accused of the monstrous crimes that this document listed. After reading it I was overwhelmed by a sense of despair. But in that despair at what had happened and my role in it, I found the position I felt I should take in the trial, to regard my own fate as insignificant, not to struggle for my own life, but to assume the responsibility in a general sense. In spite of all the opposition of my lawyer and in spite of the strains of the trial, I held fast to this resolve. Under the impact of the indictment I wrote to my wife. I must regard my life as concluded. Only then can I shape its finale in the way I consider necessary. I must stand here as a minister of the Reich and not as a private individual. I have no right to consider all of you or myself. My sole wish is that I may be strong enough to stick to this position. Strange as it may sound. I am in good spirits when I have relinquished all hope and become uncertain and nervous as soon as I think I have a chance. Perhaps, by my bearing, I can once more help the German people. Perhaps I shall accomplish it. There are not many here who will. Letter to my wife, October 17, 1945. Also, on this subject, I wrote to my wife on December 15, 1945. I am duty bound to face this tribunal. 
in view of the fate of the German people one may be too solicitous for one's own immediate family. In March 1946, I cannot put up a cheap defense here. I believe you will understand, for in the end you and the children would feel shame if I forgot that many millions of Germans fell for a false ideal slash letter to my parents, April 25, 1946. Don't solace yourselves with the idea that I am putting up a stiff fight for myself. One must bear one's responsibility here, not hope for favoring winds. At this time the prison psychologist, G. M. Gilbert, was going from cell to cell with a copy of the indictment, asking the defendants to write their comments on it. When I read the partially evasive, partially disdainful words of many of my fellow defendants, I wrote, to Gilbert's astonishment. The trial is necessary. There is a shared responsibility for such horrible crimes even in an authoritarian state. I still regard it as my greatest feat of psychic courage to have held to this view throughout the ten months of the trial. Along with the indictment we were presented with a long list of German lawyers, from whose ranks each of us could choose his defender if we had no proposals of our own. Much as I strained my memory, I could not recall a single lawyer. The names on the list were completely unknown to me, so I asked the court to make a choice. A few days later I was taken to the ground floor of the Palace of Justice. At one of the tables a slight man with strong glasses and a low voice stood up. I am supposed to be your lawyer, if you agree. My name is Dr. Hans Flaxner, from Berlin. He had friendly eyes and an unassuming manner. When we discussed various details of the indictment, he displayed a sensible, unhistrionic attitude. Finally he handed me a form. Take this with you and consider whether you want me for your defense attorney. I signed it there and then and did not regret it. In the course of the trial Flaxner proved to be a circumspect, tactful lawyer. But what mattered more to me, he felt a sympathy toward me out of which, during the ten months of the trial, a real mutual affection developed that has lasted to this day. Dining the preliminary investigation the prisoners were prevented from meeting. Now this regulation was relaxed, so that we crossed paths more often in the prison yard, where we could talk without surveillance. The trial, the indictment, the invalidity of the international tribunal, profound indignation at the disgrace, again and again as we walked our rounds of the yard I heard the same subjects and opinions. Among the twenty other defendants I found only one who shared my views. That was Fritz, with whom I could consider in detail the principle of responsibility. Later Sassinquart also showed some understanding of this. With the others, all discussion was useless and wearing. We were speaking different languages. On other questions also we naturally enough held divergent opinions. In what light we were going to describe Hitler's rule for purposes of this trial was acutely important. Goering, though he had had strong reservations about some practices of the regime, was all in favor of whitewashing Hitler. Our only hope, he held, was to use this trial to promote a positive legend. I felt that it was unethical to deceive the German people in this way, I also thought it dangerous because it would make the transition to the future more difficult for the whole nation. Only the truth could accelerate the process of cutting free from the past. I had a certain insight into Goering's real motives when he observed that the victors would undoubtedly kill him but that within fifty years his remains would be laid in a marble sarcophagus and he would be celebrated by the German people as a national hero and martyr. Many of the prisoners had the same dream about themselves. On other subjects Goering's arguments were less effective. There were no differences among us, he said, we were all sentenced to death from the start and none of us had a chance. It was pointless to bother about a defense. I remarked, Goering wants to ride into Valhalla with a large retinue. In actuality Goering later defended himself more stubbornly than the rest of us did. At Mondorf and Nuremberg, Goering had undergone a systematic withdrawal cure which had ended his drug addiction. Ever since, he was in better form than I had ever seen him. He displayed remarkable energy and became the most formidable personality among the defendants. 
I thought it a great pity that he had not been up to this level in the months before the outbreak of the war and in critical situations during the war. He would have been the only person whose authority and popularity Hitler would have had to reckon with. Actually, he had been one of the few sensible enough to foresee the doom that awaited us. But having thrown away his chance to save the country while that was still possible, it was absurd and truly criminal for him to use his regained powers to hoodwink his own people. His whole policy was one of deception. Once, in the prison yard something was said about Jewish survivors in Hungary. Goering remarked coldly, so, there are still some there? I thought we had knocked off all of them. Somebody slipped up again. I was stunned. My vow to accept responsibility for the entire regime could not be kept without some severe psychological crises. The only way of getting out of it was to escape trial by suicide. Once I tried using a towel to stop the circulation in my sick leg, in order to produce phlebitis. Remembering from one of our lectures in Kranzberg that the nicotine from even a cigar, crumbled and dissolved in water, could be fatal. I kept a crushed cigar in my pocket for a long time. But from the intention to the deed is a very long way. The Sunday Divine Services became a great support for me. Even as recently as my stay in Kranzberg I had refused to attend them. I did not want to seem soft. But in Nuremberg I threw aside such prideful feelings. The pressure of circumstances brought me, as, incidentally, it did almost all the defendants with the exception of Hess, Rosenberg, and Streicher, into our small chapel. Our suits had been put in mothballs, the Americans had provided us, during our imprisonment, with cotton gabardine fatigues dyed black. Now clothing room clerks came to our cells. We were allowed to choose which of our clothes should be cleaned for the trial. Every detail was discussed with the commandant down to the matter of sleeve buttons. After a last inspection by Colonel Andres, on November 19, 1945, we were led into the still empty courtroom, each of us escorted by a soldier, but without handcuffs. Seats were formally assigned. At the head were Goering, Hess, and Ribbentrop. I was placed third from last on the second bench, in agreeable company, say Sinquart on my right. Von Neurat on my left. Streicher and Funk sat right in front of me. I was glad that the trial was beginning, and almost all of the defendants expressed the same view, if only it were all over at last. The trial began with the grand, devastating opening address by the chief American prosecutor, Justice Robert H. Jackson. But I took comfort from one sentence in it which accused the defendants of guilt for the regime's crimes but not the German people. This thesis corresponded precisely with what I had hoped would be a subsidiary result of the trial, that the hatred directed against the German people which had been fanned by the propaganda of the war years and had reached an extreme after the revelation of those crimes, would now be focused upon us, the defendants. My theory was that the top leadership in a modern war could be expected to face the consequences at the end precisely because they had previously not been exposed to any danger. Letter to my wife, December 15, 1945, if I had not had my assignment, I would have been a soldier, and what then? Five years of war are a long time, and I would almost certainly have had more to endure and would perhaps have suffered a worse fate. I am glad to accept my situation if by so doing I can still do something for the German people. Letter of August 7, 1946, in such situations one should not think only of one's own life. Every soldier on the battlefield is faced with danger of death and has no choice in the matter. In a letter to my defense attorney who was trying to define the line we would follow, I declared that viewed within the total framework everything that we would be discussing as points in my favor appeared to me unimportant and ludicrous. For many months the documents and testimonies accumulated. These aimed to prove that the crimes had been committed, without regard to whether any one of the defendants had been personally connected with them. It was horrible, and could only be borne because our nerves became more blunted from session to session. To this day photographs, documents, 
and orders keep coming back to me. They were so monstrous that they seemed unbelievable, and yet none of the defendants doubted their genuineness. Along with this, the daily routine continued, from morning to twelve noon the trial sessions, recess for eating in the upper rooms of the Palace of Justice, from two until five o'clock second session, then returned to my cell where I changed clothes quickly, gave my suit out for pressing, had supper, and then usually was taken to the conference room for the defense where I discussed the course of the trial with my lawyer until nearly ten o'clock and made notes for the coming defense. Finally, I returned exhausted to my cell late in the evening and immediately fell asleep. On Saturdays and Sundays the court did not hold sessions, but we worked all the longer with our lawyers. Generally there remained little more than half an hour daily for a walk in the prison yard. In spite of our common situation no sense of solidarity arose among us, the defendants. We split up into groups. A significant instance was the establishment of a general's guard in a small section, no larger than twenty by twenty feet separated from the rest of the prison garden by low hedges. Here our military men trudged steadily around in self-elected isolation, although the small walking area must have been very uncomfortable. We who were civilians respected this division. For the noon meals the prison command had put a number of separate rooms at our disposal. My table mates were Fritz, Funk, and Skirak. The prison psychologist, G. M. Gilbert, has revealed in his Nuremberg Diary, New York, Farrah, Strauss Young, Incorporated, 1947, p. 158 that the different groups were established deliberately by the prison command to prevent Goering from terrorizing the defendants. Translator's Note In the meantime we had regained some hope that we would come out of the trial with our lives, since the general indictment had been followed by a detailed indictment for each defendant. Clear distinctions were made in these. Consequently, Fritz and I at this point were counting on milder judgments, for the charges against us were comparatively less harsh. In the courtroom, however, we encountered only hostile faces, icy dogmas. The only exception was the interpreter's booth. From there I might expect a friendly nod. Among the British and American prosecutors there were also some who occasionally manifested a trace of sympathy. I was taken aback when the journalists began laying bets on the extent of our penalties, and their list of those slated for hanging sometimes included us too. After a pause of several days devoted to the final preparations of the defense, the counter-attack began. A few of us expected a great deal of it. Before Goering mounted the witness stand, he had promised Funk, Sorkel, and others to take their responsibility upon himself and thus exonerate them. In his early statements, which had a considerable ring of courage, he kept this promise. But the closer he approached to details, the more disappointed grew the faces of those who were counting on him, for he then pared down his own responsibility point by point. In his duel with Goering, Prosecutor Jackson had the advantage of surprise. There were always fresh documents he could pull out of his swollen briefcase. But Goering could take advantage of his adversary's basic ignorance of the material. In the end Goering merely fought for his life, using evasions, obfuscations, and denials. Ribbentrop and Key I tell. The next two defendants, behaved in the same way. They too repudiated any responsibility, whenever confronted with a document that bore their signatures, they justified it on grounds of an order from Hitler. Disgusted, I blurted out the remark about the letter carriers on high salaries, which afterward was printed in newspapers throughout the world. When I consider the matter today, they were basically telling the truth. They were actually not much more than transmitters of Hitler's orders. Rosenberg, on the other hand, made an impression of honesty and consistency. All the efforts of his lawyer both before and behind the scenes to persuade him to recant his so-called ideology came to nothing. Hans Frank, Hitler's lawyer and later governor-general of Poland, also shouldered his responsibility. Funk reasoned skillfully and in a way that stirred my pity. 
Schacht's attorney drew on all his rhetorical resources to make his client out a rebel conspirator. His efforts ended only in his weakening rather than strengthening the actual exonerating evidence in Schacht's favor. Dennis, for his part, fought obstinately for himself and his submarines, it gave him great satisfaction when his lawyer was able to present an affidavit from Admiral Nimitz, commander of the American Pacific Fleet, stating that he had conducted his own submarine warfare on the basis of the same principles as the German naval leadership. Redder gave the impression of objectivity, Sorkel's simple-mindedness seemed rather pathetic, Jody's precise and sober defense was rather imposing. He seemed to be one of the few men who stood above the situation. The order of testimony followed the seating order. My nervousness increased, for now Sasing Quart, my neighbor, was already in the witness chair. A lawyer himself, he had no illusions about his situation, he had been a direct participant in deportations and the shooting of hostages. He seemed controlled and concluded his testimony with a statement that he must take responsibility for what had happened. By a lucky chance, a few days after the testimony which sealed his death sentence he received the first good news about his son, who up to this time had been missing in Russia. When I went to the witness stand, I had stage fright. I hastily swallowed a tranquilizing pill the German doctor had prudently handed to me. Opposite me, about ten paces away, Flaxner stood at the defense attorney's desk, on my left, at a higher level, sat the judges. Flaxner opened his thick manuscript. Questions and answers began. At the outset I stated, if Hitler had had any friends, I would certainly have been one of his close friends by which I was trying to explain something that up to this point not even the prosecution had asserted. A vast number of details referring to the documents presented were discussed. I corrected misunderstandings but tried not to sound apologetic or evasive. In court I clearly acknowledged my share of the responsibility for the forced labor program, I was grateful to Sorkel for every worker he provided me with. Often when we failed to meet armaments quotas because of a shortage of workers, I would put the blame on Sorkel. Of course I knew that foreign laborers were working in the armaments plants. I assented to this. I have made it clear enough that I approved of Sorkel's labor policy, of bringing forced labor, from the occupied areas to Germany. The laborers were for the most part brought to Germany against their will, and I raised no protest against this policy. On the contrary, at the beginning, until the autumn of 1942, I tried to have as many workers as possible brought to Germany. In a few sentences I assumed responsibility for all the orders from Hitler which I had carried out. I took the position that in every government orders must remain orders for the subordinate organs of the government, but that the leadership on all levels must examine and weigh the orders it receives and is consequently co-responsible for them, even if the orders have been carried out under duress. What mattered more to me was to assert my collective responsibility for all the measures of Hitler, not excluding the crimes, which were undertaken or committed in the period from 1942 on wherever and by whomever. In political life there is a responsibility for a man's own sector, I said to the court. For that he is of course fully responsible. But beyond that there is a collective responsibility when he has been one of the leaders. Who else is to be held responsible for the course of events, if not the closest associates around the chief of state? But this collective responsibility can only apply to fundamental matters and not to details. Even in an authoritarian system this collective responsibility of the leaders must exist, there can be no attempting to withdraw from the collective responsibility after the catastrophe. For if the war had been won, the leadership would probably have raised the claim that it was collectively responsible. I have this obligation all the more since the chief of government has withdrawn from his responsibility to the German people and to the world. Too. To say Sinquart, I expressed these ideas in more vivid fashion. How would it be if the scene suddenly changed, and we all acted as if the war had been won? Can't you just see how each of us would rush to put his merits and his achievements in the forefront? Now the thing has been switched, instead of decorations, honors, and gifts, 
death sentences are being dispersed. During the past several weeks Flaxner had tried in vain to reason me out of accepting responsibility for things that had happened outside my ministry. To do so, he said, could have fatal consequences. But after my admission I felt my spirits lightened. I was glad I had not tried to dodge the issue. Having made this matter clear, I believed I could now launch into the second part of my testimony which dealt with the last phase of the war. I believed it important to present these data, chiefly for their effect on the German people. If they learned of Hitler's intentions to destroy the very basis of life for the German people after the loss of the war, it would help the nation turn its back on the past. Letter to my wife, June 1946 what matters most to me is that I manage to tell the truth about the end. That is what the German people must be told. Letter, mid-August, the best way I can help my people is to speak the truth about the whole madness. There are no benefits for me in this course, nor do I want any benefits. Here was strong evidence to counter the creation of a Hitler legend. But when I said these things, I encountered stiff disapproval from Goering and other defendants. Three, In court I intended merely to mention my plan to assassinate Hitler, chiefly in order to show how dangerous Hitler's destructive intentions had seemed to me. I prefer not to go into the details, I said. The judges put their heads together. The presiding judge then turned to me, the court would like to hear the details. We will hold our recess now. I did not want to make any further statements on the matter, for fear of seeming to boast about it. I sketched the story with considerable reluctance and agreed with my defense attorney that he was not to use this part of my testimony in his final plea. Four. Back in the safe track of our interrogation manuscript, the concluding part of my testimony ran rapidly through the last period of the war without interruption. In order to diminish any impression of special merits, I deliberately qualified my remarks, all these measures were not even so dangerous. From January 1945 on, it was possible inside Germany to carry out any reasonable measure contrary to the official policy. Every sensible person welcomed such measures. Everyone involved knew what our, counter, orders meant. Even long-standing party members came to the nation's aid in that period. Jointly we were able to do a great deal to undercut Hitler's insane orders. Flaxner closed his manuscript with visible relief and went to his seat among the other lawyers. Justice Jackson, the chief U.S. prosecutor, took his place. For me that was no surprise, for the previous evening an American officer had come rushing to my cell to tell me that Jackson had decided to cross-examine me himself. In contrast to his usual manner, Jackson began quietly, in an almost benevolent voice. After he had again ascertained by documents and questions that I admitted co-responsibility for the employment of millions of forced laborers, he discussed the second part of my testimony in a favorable light. I had, he said, been the only man who had had the courage to tell Hitler to his face that the war was lost. I interposed, saying that Guderian, Jodl, and many of the commanders of army groups had also defied Hitler. When he asked the further question, then there were more plots than you have told us. I replied rather evasively, in that period it was remarkably easy to concoct a plot. You could accost almost anyone on the street. If you told him what the situation was, he would answer, it's sheer madness. And if he had the courage, he would offer his aid. It was not so dangerous as it looks from here, for there were perhaps a few dozen irrational people, the other 80 million were extremely rational as soon as they realized what was involved. 5. After a further cross-examination by General Raginsky, the representative of the Soviet prosecution, an examination full of misunderstandings because of errors by the interpreters, Flaxner once more stepped forward. He handed the court a sheaf of written statements by my twelve witnesses. With that, the presentation of my case was over. For hours I had been gripped by severe stomach pains. Back in my cell, I threw myself on my cot, overwhelmed equally by physical pain and mental exhaustion. 35. Conclusions For the last time the prosecutors took the floor, 
their summations concluded the trial. For us only our final speeches remained. Since these were to be broadcast in full over the radio, they had a special significance. They were our last chance to address our own people, but also our last chance, by admitting our guilt, by facing squarely the crimes of the past, to show the nation that we had led astray away out of its squandery. One, The nine months of trial had left their marks on us. Even Goering, who had entered the trial with an aggressive determination to justify himself, spoke in his final speech of the terrible crimes that had been brought to light, condemned the ghastly mass murders, and declared that he could not comprehend them. Key Itel stated that he would rather choose death than be entangled again in such horrors. Frank spoke of the guilt that Hitler and the German people had laden upon themselves. He warned the incorrigibles against the way of political folly which must lead to destruction and death. His speech sounded overwrought, but it expressed the essence of my own view also. Even Streicher in his final speech condemned Hitler's mass killings of Jews. Funk spoke of frightful crimes that filled him with profound shame. Schacht declared that he stood shaken to the depths of his soul by the unspeakable misery which he had tried to prevent. Sorkel was shocked in his inmost soul by the crimes that had been revealed in the course of the trial. Papen declared that the power of evil had proved stronger than that of good. Seysinkwart spoke of fearful excesses. To Fritz the murder of five million people was a gruesome warning for the future. On the other hand they all denied their own share in these events. In a sense my hopes had been realized. The judicial guilt had been concentrated to a large extent upon us, the defendants. But during that accursed era, a factor in addition to human depravity had entered history, the factor that distinguished our tyranny from all historical precedents, and a factor that would inevitably increase in importance in the future. As the top representative of a technocracy which had without compunction used all its know-how in an assault on humanity, the readiness of technicians to carry out any order is, of course, not limited to our country. A year later, Harry L. Stimson, U.S. Secretary of State from 1929-33, Secretary of War from 1911-13 and 1940-45, wrote an article, The Numberg Trial, Landmark in Law, Foreign Affairs, 1947, in which he said, we must never forget, that under modem conditions of life, science, and technology, all war has become greatly brutalized, and that no one who joins in it, even in self-defense, can escape becoming also in a measure brutalized. Modem war cannot be limited in its destructive method and the inevitable debasement of all participants. A fair scrutiny of the last two world wars makes clear the steady intensification in the inhumanity of the weapons and methods employed by both, the aggressors and the victors. In order to defeat Japanese aggression, we were forced, as Admiral Nimitz has stated, to employ a technique of unrestricted submarine warfare, not unlike that which 25 years ago was the proximate cause of our entry into World War I. In the use of strategic air power the Allies took the lives of hundreds of thousands of civilians in Germany and in Japan. We as well as our enemies have contributed to the proof that the central moral problem is war and not its methods, and that a continuance of war will in all probability end with the destruction of our civilization. I tried not only to confess but also to understand what had happened. In my final speech I said, Hitler's dictatorship was the first dictatorship of an industrial state in this age of modem technology, a dictatorship which employed to perfection the instruments of technology to dominate its own people. By means of such instruments of technology as the radio and public address systems, 80 million persons could be made subject to the will of one individual. Telephone, teletype and radio made it possible to transmit the commands of the highest levels directly to the lowest organs where because of their high authority they were executed uncritically. Thus many officers and squads received their evil commands in this direct manner. The instruments of technology made it possible to maintain a close watch over all citizens and to keep criminal operations shrouded in a high degree of secrecy. 
To the outsider this state apparatus may look like the seemingly wild tangle of cables in a telephone exchange, but like such an exchange it could be directed by a single will. Dictatorships of the past needed assistance of high quality in the lower ranks of the leadership also, men who could think and act independently. The authoritarian system in the age of technology can do without such men. The means of communication alone enable it to mechanize the work of the lower leadership. Thus the type of uncritical receiver of orders is created. The criminal events of those years were not only an outgrowth of Hitler's personality. The extent of the crimes was also due to the fact that Hitler was the first to be able to employ the implements of technology to multiply crime. I thought of the consequences that unrestricted rule together with the power of technology, making use of it but also driven by it, might have in the future. This war, I continued, had ended with remote controlled rockets, aircraft flying at the speed of sound, atom bombs, and a prospect of chemical warfare. In five to ten years it would be possible for an atomic rocket, perhaps serviced by ten men, to annihilate a million human beings in the center of New York within seconds. It would be possible to spread plagues and destroy harvests. The more technological the world becomes, the greater is the danger. As the former minister in charge of a highly developed armaments economy it is my last duty to state, a new great war will end with the destruction of human culture and civilization. There is nothing to stop unleashed technology and science from completing its work of destroying man which it has so terribly begun in this war. Point 2. The nightmare shared by many people, I said, that someday the nations of the world may be dominated by technology, that nightmare was very nearly made a reality under Hitler's authoritarian system. Every country in the world today faces the danger of being terrorized by technology, but in a modem dictatorship this seems to me to be unavoidable. Therefore, the more technological the world becomes, the more essential will be the demand for individual freedom and the self-awareness of the individual human being as a counterpoise to technology. Consequently this trial must contribute to laying down the ground rules for life in human society. What does my own fate signify, after all that has happened and in comparison with so important a goal? After the course the trial had run, my situation was, as I saw it, desperate. My last sentence was by no means intended as a theoretical profession of faith. I considered my life at its close. Three. The court recessed for an indefinite period to consider the verdicts. We waited four long weeks. During this time of almost unbearable suspense, exhausted by the preceding eight months of mental torment, I read Dickens's novel of the French Revolution, A Tale of Two Cities. He describes how the prisoners in the Bastille looked forward with tranquility and often with cheerful serenity toward their fate. But I was incapable of such inner freedom. The Soviet prosecution had urged the death sentence for me. On September 30, 1946, in freshly pressed suits, we took our seats in the dock for the last time. The court wanted to spare us the movie cameras and photographers at this juncture. The spotlights which earlier had illuminated the large courtroom to allow the recording of each of our emotions were extinguished. The room assumed an unusually gloomy aspect as the judges entered and defendants, lawyers, prosecutors, spectators and press representatives rose in their honor for the last time. As on every day of the trial, the presiding judge, Lord Lawrence, bowed to all sides, to us, the defendants, as well. Then he sat down. The judges took turns. For several hours they monotonously read out the most dreadful chapter in German history. Still, the condemnation of the leadership seemed to me to exonerate the German people from judicial guilt. For if Baldur von Skirach, for many years leader of the German youth and one of Hitler's closest associates, and if Hilmerschacht, Hitler's minister of economics at the beginning of the rearmament, were acquitted of having prepared and carried out aggressive warfare, then how could any ordinary soldier, let alone women and children, be burdened with the guilt? If Grand Admiral Reder and Hitler's deputy, Rudolf Hess, were acquitted of having participated in the crimes against humanity, 
how could a German engineer or worker be held answerable? I also hoped that the trial would exert a direct influence upon the occupation policies of the victorious powers. They for their part could not very well mete out to our people the treatment they themselves had just defined as criminal. In this, I had mainly in mind the main charge against me, forced labor.4. There followed the justification of the verdict for each individual case, but as yet without announcement of the verdict itself.5 My own activities were described in a cool and unbiased fashion, in total accord with what I myself had already declared during my interrogation. My responsibility for the deportation of foreign workers was stated, then that I had opposed Himmler's plans solely on the tactical grounds of their effect on production but had used his concentration camp inmates without protest and had requisitioned Soviet prisoners of war for work in the armaments industry. It added to my culpability that I had raised no humane and ethical considerations in these cases, thus helping to forge the policy of raising foreign laborers by force. None of the defendants, including those who could certainly count on the death sentence, lost his composure as the judges read out these charges. In silence, without any outward sign of emotion, they listened. It still remains incredible to me that I was able to stick it out through the trial without breaking down and that I was able to listen to the reading of the judgment with anxiety, but still with a measure of strength and self-control. Flaxner was over-optimistic the judgment means you'll receive perhaps four or five years. The next day we, the defendants, saw each other for the last time before the announcement of the individual sentences. We met in the basement of the Palace of Justice. One after the other we entered a small elevator and did not return. In the courtroom above the sentence was announced. Finally it was my turn. Accompanied by an American soldier, I rode up in the elevator. A door opened, and I stood alone on a small platform in the courtroom, facing the judges. Earphones were handed to me. In my ears the words reverberated, Albert's beer, to twenty years imprisonment. A few days later I accepted the sentence. I waived the right to an appeal to the four powers. Any penalty weighed little compared to the misery we had brought upon the world. For there are things. I noted in my diary a few weeks later, for which one is guilty even if one might offer excuses, simply because the scale of the crimes is so overwhelming that by comparison any human excuse pales to insignificance. Today, a quarter of a century after these events, it is not only specific faults that burden my conscience, great as these may have been. My moral failure is not a matter of this item and that it resides in my active association with the whole course of events. I had participated in a war which, as we of the intimate circle should never have doubted, was aimed at world dominion. What is more, by my abilities and my energies I had prolonged that war by many months. I had assented to having the globe of the world crowned that domed hall which was to be the symbol of New Berlin. Nor was it only symbolically that Hitler dreamed of possessing the globe. It was part of his dream to subjugate the other nations. France, I had heard him say many times, was to be reduced to the status of a small nation. Belgium, Holland, even Burgundy, were to be incorporated into his Reich. The national life of the Poles and the Soviet Russians was to be extinguished, they were to be made into Helot peoples. Nor, for one who wanted to listen, had Hitler ever concealed his intention to exterminate the Jewish people. In his speech of January 30, 1939, 6 he openly stated as much. Although I never actually agreed with Hitler on these questions, I had nevertheless designed the buildings and produced the weapons which served his ends. During the next twenty years of my life I was guarded, in Spandau prison, by nationals of the four powers against whom I had organized Hitler's war. Along with my six fellow prisoners. They were the only people I had close contact with. Through them I learned directly what the effects of my work had been. Many of them mourned loved ones who had died in the war, in particular, every one of the Soviet guards had lost some close relative, brothers or a father. 
yet not one of them bore a grudge toward me for my personal share in the tragedy, never did I hear words of recrimination. At the lowest ebb of my existence, in contact with these ordinary people, I encountered uncorrupted feelings of sympathy, helpfulness, human understanding, feelings that bypassed the prison rules. On the day before my appointment as Minister of Armaments and War Production I had encountered peasants in the Ukraine who had saved me from frostbite. At the time I had been merely touched, without understanding. Now, after all was over, I once again was treated to examples of human kindness that transcended all enmity. And now, at last, I wanted to understand. This book, too, is an attempt at such understanding. The catastrophe of this war, I wrote in my cell in 1947, has proved the sensitivity of the system of modem civilization evolved in the course of centuries. Now we know that we do not live in an earthquake-proof structure. The build-up of negative impulses, each reinforcing the other, can inexorably shake to pieces the complicated apparatus of the modem world. There is no halting this process by will alone. The danger is that the automatism of progress will depersonalize man further and withdraw more and more of his self-responsibility. Dazzled by the possibilities of technology, I devoted crucial years of my life to serving it. But in the end my feelings about it are highly skeptical. Afterward. In writing this book my intention has been not only to describe the past, but to issue warnings for the future. During the first months of my imprisonment, while I was still in Nuremberg, I wrote a great deal, out of the need to relieve some of the burden that pressed so heavily upon me. That was also the motivation for further studies and notes undertaken during 1946 and 1947. Finally, in March 1953 I decided to set down my memoirs in coherent form. Was it a disadvantage or an advantage that they were written under conditions of depressing solitude? At the time I was often startled by the ruthlessness with which I judged others and myself. On December 26, 1954, I finished the first draft. When I was released from Spandau prison on October 1, 1966, consequently, I found more than 2,000 pages of my own writing at my disposal. Then, with the aid of the documents of my ministry preserved in the Federal Archives in Koblenz, I reworked this material into the present autobiography. I am indebted to the editors who discussed many problems with me over two years, Wolf Jobs Tsiedler, head of the Alstein and Proplan publishing houses, and Joachim C. Fest, member of the advisory board of these publishers. Their keen questions helped me frame many of the general observations in this book, as well as my treatment of the psychological and atmospheric aspects of events. My fundamental view of Hitler, his system, and my own part in it, as I had set it down fourteen years earlier in the first version of my memoirs, was confirmed and reinforced by our conversations. I am also indebted to Dr. Alfred Wagner, UNESCO, Paris, to archivist Dr. Thomas Trump and Frau Hedwig Singer of the Federal Archives, Koblenz, and to David Irving for permitting me to use several previously unpublished diary entries of Jodlin Goebbels.